Okay, recording started. Three, two, one. Hey everyone, I want to welcome you back to another episode of Tendy Town. This is going to be the free episode for the month of June. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about going bottom fishing. But before I begin this episode, I want to first explain what Tendy Town is for anybody that may not be familiar with it. And I want to give you some brief updates on the content you can expect from me in the future. So I started Tendy Town back in March of 2021 because as I was getting more followers on Twitter, I was bombarded with more questions. And, you know, one of my weaknesses is that I'm not super succinct with my answers. I don't feel that I can give people the answers that I'm looking to give them and my reasoning behind why with, you know, a simple 280 character tweet. So I decided that the best way for me to actually be able to answer people's questions and give people some insight into um, my thoughts on certain things was to start a podcast. So I signed up with Substack because initially I was just going to be, you know, writing in like a newsletter and I was just going to write the content. But then I found it immensely easier for me to just be able to talk about it because um, my brain just kind of flows better that way. And, uh, you know, Tiny Town was born and, um, you know, we've been going strong ever since. Uh, and the way Tendy Town works is I do charge $19.99 a month or $199 a year, but I do donate every single cent to charity. I've never pocketed a single cent of it. I make sure that I'm always posting not only the revenue statements from that I get from Stripe at the end of every single month, but the actual donation and the donation receipt uh, when I receive them from whatever charity we've been donating to for uh, you know the past few months. Um, the first six months we donated to American Cancer Society, the next five or six months we donated to Alzheimer's Association, and since February of this year we've been donating to Feeding America. So that's like sort of the fee I like to pay, you know, it makes, excuse me, the fee I like to charge people. Um, I don't get to pocket any of the money, it's a way for me to sort of give back to like a good cause, but it also forces people to sort of value the information that they're hearing and actually utilize something that they're paying for. Um, the catch is that at the end of the year, I do get a small tax write-off of about, you know, twenty or $30,000. Um, but, you know, that doesn't make a huge dent on capital gains or anything like that. It's just a way for me to try to, you know, put out decent education, I guess, or maybe just share my personal experience with people that are interested in it. So there's absolutely no obligation for you to sign up. Um, you know, it's only something that if you are curious on my opinion, you can do, but it's absolutely not required. I don't withhold any content from my Twitter profile. Uh, you know, it's just a way for me to explain things, you know, sort of week by week um, and what I'm seeing behind it. Um, so there's you if you are interested, you can sign up for a seven day free trial with no obligation. Don't like it. Don't sign up. Um, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel. You'll get access to, you know, all of these free ep episodes of Tenny Town and any YouTube videos I've made in the past. Um, and that leads me to the last thing that I wanted to say real quick, which is um, I hope you can tell by the audio quality, but I was actually halfway through recording this episode uh, earlier this morning when I was getting really frustrated with my mic and I realized that I had a crappy Blue Yeti. It was a $130 USB mic. And I've been doing Tiny Town for way too long to not upgrade the quality to the best standard that I can. So I impulsively went out and dropped $1,000 on a new setup with a Shure SM7B, um, which I hope you can notice the audio quality difference and all the transmitters and cords and stands that I needed for that. Um, so that's a way for me to sort of, uh, you know, produce higher quality content, whether it comes from Tiny Town or whether it becomes from the YouTube videos that I'm going to be pumping out in the future. Um, something I want to do with my YouTube channel is I want to make um, not super long form content like podcasts, but I think I get a lot of questions when it comes to like specific stocks and stuff or how, how I go about, you know, valuing them properly and things like that and things to focus on and things to stay away from. I feel like my, my main niche on Twitter has been like the person that like tries to simple things down. Like I feel like a lot of times people really overcomplicate things and it's like, I don't know if they're trying to sound smart or I don't know if it's that's, you know, they're just so smart that they can't verbalize it properly. Um, but my, I feel my job on Twitter, the way that I want to impact uh, people on Twitter is just making sure that I'm trying to simplify things as soon as to, you know, as, as easy to understand things as possible. Um, because I feel like that's when people can actually start making the appropriate decisions and sort of building the foundations that they need to actually like better their financial lives. So I hope that makes sense. Um, if you are interested in signing up for Tiny Town, again, there is absolutely no requirement for you to do that whatsoever. Uh, you can click the link down in the description of this YouTube video or the pinned comment. Or if you are listening on the Substack app, you can just go over to Tiny Town and hit the subscribe button. 
Uh, and if you don't want to sign up for any of the paid content, you can just sign up for the free content and it'll give you, um, you know, little previews and, and things when it comes to um, when I release free types of content. So anyways, with that being said, um, you know, I am greatly appreciative of all the people that, um, you know, value what I have to say. Uh, and, you know, because if it wasn't for the people that signed up for Tenny Town, um, you know, I wouldn't be able to make these donations and actually, uh, you know, make a, a quantitative impact on the world. So it's really cool that uh, so many people are supporting me. Um, and I really hope that you are getting a lot more than, you know, nineteen ninety nine a month out of it. Um, but enough about me. Let's get into this episode. So this episode, I want to talk about bottom fishing. And if you couldn't tell by the title of this episode, I think so many goddamn people are so focused on where, what price that everything is going to bottom at that they're losing sight of like what actually matters. So something that I often talk about on this podcast is that everybody is operating on different time frames. And I feel that's responsible for about 95% of the arguments that take place on Twitter is you have two people that are immensely disagreeing with each other, but one of them is an intraday trader and the other one is a swing trader and the other one's an investor. And they're all so busy pointing fingers at each other and calling themselves a fucking idiot for having a different take on things that they fail to recognize that everybody has a different time frame that they're looking to take these trades or make investments based on. So I think it's very, very important to sort of recognize that. And I was actually, um, I saw this quote the other day that I thought was amazing from George Carlin. What George Carlin said is when, you know, when you're driving, everybody that's going slower than you and is, is an idiot and everybody going faster than you is a maniac. And it's so true because like if you're going like a certain speed on the freeway and you know, somebody's going five miles under, you're like, oh, get, get the fuck out of the way, you asshole. But if somebody like speeds by you at like five or 10 miles an hour, you're like, oh, slow down. That guy's driving like a maniac. So I thought it was a great example to sort of relay to, you know, the time frames that people are investing on or, you know, trading on. And I think that's so important because um, I'm someone that I think is a little bit more long-term oriented than most of the people on Twitter. I think most people on Twitter are, um, you know, they, they probably generate higher returns than me. They probably, um, you know, trade intraday a lot. Maybe they introduce leverage. Maybe they're trading perpetuals. Maybe they're trading options. Um, you know, they're someone that is more susceptible to volatility. I'm someone that, like, volatility doesn't affect me that much because I don't operate on a day-to-day -day or a week-to-week -week time frame. I just found over the years that I make about two or three really good decisions a year and that I can make a lot more money in my own personal life when I focus on making super high quality two or three decisions a year rather than worrying about, you know, where price is going next week and whatnot. And so I think you have a lot of people on Twitter that have been obviously for like the past six months arguing about what price they're going to buy that. The, what, what price they're going to buy back their Bitcoin or their Ethereum or, uh, you know, their S&P 500 index fund or whatever it is. And I just don't think that people understand that stocks and crypto function on two very different sorts of fundamentals. Um, and then on top of that, you have all the people disagreeing on what sort of time frame um, people should be focusing on. And it just makes for the, uh, you know, toxic landfill that currently is my Twitter timeline. And so... It's very, very important, I think, to first discuss uh, cryptocurrency because I think that's something that um, has been a lot more volatile and something that people are uh, a lot more wound up about in recent uh, terms. And I think what a lot of people are really focusing on on Twitter is where's the bottom? What price is the bottom? And in my personal experience, I find that to be a tremendous waste of time. And the reason because... Uh, crypto is very cyclical in nature, um, and there's only one thing that I have ever found that plays a very significant role in actually affecting the price that people will pay for crypto, and a lot of that is very dependent on Bitcoin. Now, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist, but you do ha understand when you've been in the market for a long enough period of time that Bit Bitcoin drives the direction of the market, and altcoins are the leverage. So if Bitcoin is, you know, going to make a 20% move, uh, typically you're going to see altcoins pull a 50% move in whatever direction that is. So you have to understand that ultimately at the end of the day, no matter how much you like a certain altcoin, no matter how much you think of a role it's going to play in the future, you have to understand that 
none of that really matters until you um, you know, Bitcoin is in a position for it to go up. And obviously, it's only in a position for it to go up when there is more demand than there is, you know, supply. And so that's why I think crypto is very cyclical in nature, because the essence of the crypto market functions around the, the Bitcoin halving. Um, and the way that I try to, you know, I don't think a lot of people, I mean, people understand what halving is. But I think a way that I think should be explained more often is that Bitcoin halving is like Apple buying back 50% of their stock, right? So most of you have probably heard of what a stock buyback is. It's when a company has a ton of cash from their profits, they decide they're going to reduce the shares outstanding. So they buy back, say, $20 billion, share, uh, $20 billion worth of shares, which makes up, say, 7 or 8% of the company. So if they do that over a long enough tier- period of time, not only does it boost the earnings per share of each individual share because the amount of shares are going down, it also forces the price up because there are less shares um, to be traded on the market. Uh, and you have this rather you know huge bid buying back until uh, you know the company allots uh, another buyback. I think Apple maybe 10 years ago had about, uh, fuck, I don't remember what it was, maybe 300 million shares outstanding or a billion shares outstanding. Anyways, they've reduced it like 80% in the last, um, you know, 10 years. And that's because Apple's been making so much money. That's how they reward their shareholders because it's a way for them to boost the EPS and the dividend and the price appreciation that Apple shareholders are looking for. And I think a lot more people would do better off understanding that a Bitcoin halving is basically like, uh, you know, Apple announcing that they're going to buy back 50% of the shares. So over time, um, that reduction in the amount of Bitcoin outstanding is going to impact the price. Um, And until you have that sort of like announcement or that realization when it actually comes to the blockchain, um, you have to understand that that's basically what drives Bitcoin up, at least. It's the idea that the demand has been increasing ever since it's been uh, more mainstream, yet the supply is continuing to decrease um, because block rewards are getting cut in half. So if you treat Bitcoin and understand that a lot of the, the upside uh, movement behind Bitcoin res- revolves around the halving, then you can understand that th- when you have been in this period where you've had rapid price appreciation as a result of one halving, um, but you're still, you know, two years away from the other, then you can understand that there isn't as large of an incentive for people to go out and be buying this thing. Um, And they might as well wait to that period of time. And, you know, Bitcoin is something I, you know, a lot of people think it's voodoo. I see a ton of people that are subscribing to this idea of like moon cycles, but nobody subscribes the idea that you basically buy close to a Bitcoin halving, you know, maybe six months prior, maybe a year prior, um, and you ride it up until the second, you know, the second, like, Q4 of that halving. So it's about a year and a half, and it's, you know, it hasn't been that way for the entirety of history, but this makes three cycles in a row now, where you have this sort of price build up uh, as people start trying to front run this halving. You have the halving come into actualization, and block awards get cut in half. You have this rapid price appreciation, And then you see the market topping out in Q4, um, the year after halving occurs. And so you have so many people right now that are like arguing, okay, is is 30K a place valuable where enough people are going to step in and buy Bitcoin? And it's like, why don't you guys understand that like Bitcoin, the value in Bitcoin is not actually like the price that you're paying for it. It's the fact that you own a certain amount and that amount, uh, you know, basically doubles in value when you cut the reward and how much is being distributed in half every four years. So I think a lot more people would be better off if they took this approach that crypto is a very cyclical asset class. And so people should not be focusing, well, is 29k a good buy? Is 35k too expensive? Uh, You know, if we go back to 45k as a new bull market on, that's not what people should be focusing on. They should be focusing on, okay, typically Bitcoin bottoms out about a year after it peaks in the second Q4 after halving. So if we topped out in November of 2021, you should probably be looking to buy around November of 2022. You will probably start getting some front running for the halving in 20 in mid 2023. And then in 2024, you have the halving come into actualization. And that's when you should expect some actual price appreciation. So 
you know, you got so many people that are debating price. Nobody's focusing on the fact that it's fucking June. We're still six months away from, you know, even what I would call somewhat early front running when it comes to halving. And, you know, I think that's something that's going to catastrophically destroy uh, most people's portfolios. And they don't understand that, you know, if there isn't like this kind of bullish narrative for Bitcoin, uh, nobody's going to stop people from selling Solana or Ethereum during that time. You have to understand that all coins function as leverage uh, within the crypto ecosystem. So there is no reason that you should be going out trying to bottom fish, like especially these altcoins, you know. Ethereum fell 94% in 2018, and, you know, people are just saying, you know, this is the bottom, this is the bottom, this is the bottom. They've been saying that for, like, four or five times. It's like, you have to make this decision in your mind. Are you someone that cares about the price that you're buying it at, or do you just care that it's going to go up over time? Because if you're someone that you believe that Solana is going to be worth $1,000 a coin in 2025, does it matter that much if you're paying $38 today or $25 next week? I mean, obviously, it's going to affect your returns a little bit, but what's going to affect your returns the most is if you never buy Solana. If you're so busy trying to buy the bottom and then it goes lower and then you sell out of it and you continue to repeat that process until you've lost 90% of your portfolio, um, you know, is that the game you really want to be playing? Or do you want to try to guess if Solana is going to go up to $1,000 a coin or go to absolute zero because the network doesn't function properly and you have to have logical reasoning behind all of that? But I think so many people are so focused on this fucking idea that crypto should bottom as a as a result of price. Like people have become so emotionally attached to crypto that they start, you know, putting these rationalizations and they come in the form of quote unquote narratives. But what they it really are are rationalization for why they want the price to go in a certain direction. But people don't understand that Bitcoin doesn't have any actual fundamentals aside from halving. When you look at a stock, there is a solid earnings per share basis where everybody has a mutual and universal understanding of what this should be valued at. Yes, it's going to be affected by monetary policy, slightly. People over-exaggerate the shit out of that, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, yes, it should be affected by interest rates because that's going to affect the discount rate in which you can value something. But over time, stocks follow the earnings per share. So if you're someone that believes that 10 years, 5, 10 years from now, Google is going to be uh, earning a hell of a lot more money than they are today, then that's something you should be investing in, regardless of what the Fed is doing, regardless of what interest rates are at, or regardless of what valuations are at. If you think that Google today earning $100 per share, and in 10 years they're going to be earning $500 per share, who gives a fuck if you pay $2,400 or $2,200 a share, you know? Um you don't have that basis in crypto. There is no universal understanding of value. The only thing universal in crypto is that you have the halving, which reduces the supply and the block reward by half, which is essential to basically Apple buying back 50% of their shares. So you have to view it in this manner that there is an actual catalyst for why the price should go up as long as demand stays the same. You know, like simple macro supply and demands and, and that you probably learned in your macroeconomics class. But you can't actually value crypto based on price because there is no actual way to value it properly, which is why you get so much room for people like uh, the Winklevoss twins telling you you need to buy Bitcoin because of hyperinflation. Well, congratulations, you fucking idiot. Now you're down 55% from the high and inflation is still at 10%. Thanks. You just caused, you know, most people to enter a personal financial depression, right? You can't get emotionally attached to these narratives. Super cycle was a big one, right? And, you know, I you know, I was someone that was like, you know, I think that's a possibility. I didn't think that it was quite as believable as maybe other people was thought. I was more outspoken against the flippening than I was against the super cycle. Um, you know, I thought super cycle was not that we were gonna go to a million, but I was interested in the idea that Bitcoin was going to be a less volatile asset with less drawdowns and maybe there could be an extended cycle because, um, you know, just sort of the environment that we're in. But if anything's become clear in the past, you know, year or so, it's really that it's usually not different this time, um, which is going to lead me into, um, you know, talking about stocks a little bit here. Um, I think in stocks, it's a very different approach from crypto. Because stocks, you have so many options for things that will probably never go to zero. Whereas crypto is a very, very, very minute amount of uh, 
of coins that will actually not go to zero. A lot of people's favorite coins today will end up going to zero. The only thing that probably will certainly, not certainly, but like 99% probability that won't go to zero is Bitcoin. So I think if you're someone that likes the idea of like dollar cost averaging in the same way that you might do to your 401k, if you're somebody that can recognize that Bitcoin will probably not face any sort of right, rapid price appreciation until 2024, and you can stomach possibly a drawdown to 12,000, um, then I think 30k is a very reasonable price, um, and it's a very reasonable place that you're paying for it because you understand that eventually it's going to go back up. Um, but I think the problem is that most people on Twitter are live and die by volatility you know it's it's the bane of their existence and the idea and and people are usually so over leveraged to the tits that the idea of uh you know the price dropping by 10 percent is something that could wipe out their life savings and i think that's a really stupid thing to operate on but again i'm not somebody that operates on that time frame there are plenty of traders that have made way more money than me leveraging up and making the right decisions in short periods of time you just have to know yourself I personally view short-term trading um, as something that's just not worth the mental taxation of it. I don't think it's good for your mental health. I don't think it'll boost my returns. So it's something that I don't participate in. But if you think it's something that's going to be beneficial to your future, then I can't say, you know, it's not for you. That's obviously your call to make. But when it comes to stocks, you know, I'm seeing a lot of talk about the Fed. Um, and I think people are giving the Fed way too much credit. Uh, people view the Fed as like this powerful mystique, right? Uh, like the Illuminati and, and all of this, you know, it's this powerful rich people that are basically controlling our financial lives and trying to ensure that we never get ahead. And I think if you're operating in the time in, in the sort of like mental headspace to where you believe that wholeheartedly, I don't think you're in the place to actually make good decisions that are going to allow you to get out of that circumstance. I think you have to understand um, that the Fed is not as powerful as people like to make it. I see a huge argument that people have been making recently because um, if you're not aware, if you're somebody that doesn't typically follow like macroeconomics or, um, you know, the Fed in general, um, recently they've been um, uh, changing monetary policy. So back in 2020 and 2021, they were doing a ton of quantitative easing. They were buying mortgage-backed securities and treasury bonds to ensure that there was stability in the credit markets. Um, not only have they stopped that, they are now, um, as of uh, last week, starting something called um, uh, quantitative tightening, which means that they're actually selling um, the securities that they were purchasing in order to stabilize the economy back when uh, the pandemic hit. And so now it is sort of destabilizing, you know, credit and financial markets. And what you're starting to see is that people in the same way that they were saying, you know, don't fight the Fed on the way up because they're basically creating a machine of infinite liquidity. You're saying people, a lot of people saying don't fight the Fed on the way down. It's not time to buy until they reverse monetary policy. And that is a very, very logical way to approach it when you are a trader. When you're someone that is very reliant, uh, where a 5% move in the equity markets is a huge uh, effect on your portfolio, yes, it's very, very important for you to pay attention to the Fed. Um, and if you are, you know, especially like a futures trader or something like that, um, I think people give too much credit to how much the Fed plays on crypto markets. I think most of that uh, isn't actually the Fed. It's just those market makers like Jump and what and whatnot um, running those correlation algorithms on Bitcoin and the S&P 500, um, which I truthfully think is going to hurt a lot of people uh, later down the line because they're going to expect Bitcoin to follow the S&P 500 and it's going to totally decouple and people are going to go, ah, oh, this is a fucking scam anyways. Um, but yeah, basically a lot of people are associating the Fed with a lot of power and they do have a lot of power. Obviously, they are controlling monetary and fiscal policy in America. But the same people that give the Fed a lot of credit for the power are the same people that are criticizing them for being idiots when it comes to not reacting to inflation at a fast enough at a fast enough pace that has put us in the predicament that we are in today. Um, so you have to remember that this is a very double-edged sword. Yes, the Fed can have influence on the health of the economy and the growth of the economy, but focusing on the Fed as your main decision maker when it comes to whether you're buying or selling something is dumb because even the Fed doesn't know what they're doing, right? So you have to always take that kind of stuff with a grain of salt. And 
you know, I don't like to give macroeconomics takes because I don't think that it's important to focus on macroeconomics. I just talked about that example with Google. If you think Google is going to be earning $500 a share uh, in the next 10 years, does it really matter uh, whether, you know, interest rates are at 5% or 3% today or whether the Fed is adding things to their balance sheet or taking it away? Um, the reality is, is that uh, the Fed is doing things to try to uh, first curb inflation, and once they curb inflation, they're probably going to try to fix uh, any employment issues and try to get employment or unemployment down to as low as they possibly can. Um, and th and that's their main responsibilities. And I think people give them too much credit when it comes to uh, the stock market. I don't think that the stock market um, is is a great indication of you know how the economy is doing itself, especially when the Fed doesn't use the stock market um, verbally or publicly. As, as a meter um, for how everything is doing. Now, they use the bond market, that's for sure, because the bond market is and the Treasury Department and everything like that uh, is very dependent on monetary policy. But the stock market is something that I don't think really um, concerns them. What concerns them is inflation and unemployment and things like that. So I think people, um, you know, are taking this approach where, you know, stocks don't look like they're going to bottom anytime soon. Uh, there's a recession on the way that gives me a reason to not buy or that gives me a reason to sell my Bitcoin. And you just have to understand that, um, first of all, we're all operating on different time frames. But second of all, these are very uncorrelated um, assets uh, and people are very confused because of the correlation algorithms that are being run. But when we look on things from a longer time frame, um, you know, these assets have nothing to do with each other. Um, and until Bitcoin or if Bitcoin ever actually plays a role in economics uh, and not just, you know, a way for people to speculate, um, then I think you can begin having that discussion. But I clearly don't think that, you know, uh, Bitcoin is in a position right now to where um, it plays any sort of role in the financial system, which is, I think, the intention of creating Bitcoin is not having it become a part of the financial system. And the last thing I want to talk on in this episode is that I feel like a lot of people are sort of taking this approach where um, they're so focused on trying to figure out um, what's going to happen tomorrow that they forget that things like this and things um, that create that sort of like anxiety have happened all the time. Um, you know, people think, you know, we'll, we'll, they'll go out and they'll say, you know, it's different this time. Um, but the reality is, is it's not different this time. You just forgot how the last time felt. And, you know, I, I think the best example is probably the financial crisis. I mean, we're talking about huge institutional banks, like completely going under, becoming insolvent. People thought it was the end of capitalism. They thought everything was going to zero. And, you know, now we're in this scenario where America has had basically the best bull market since the uh, in the last 50 years coming out of that crisis. And you just have so many people on the timeline right now, both crypto and both stocks, that are so fucking pessimistic. It's unbelievable how much attention these fucking people are getting. It almost pisses me off because what they're really doing is they're using recency bias in order to sort of manipulate the way that people approach things. And, you know, people often forget most of the time when the markets sell off or they crash or whatnot, uh, people forget to give credit to the fact that basically every single time in history, they have recovered, even when it seemed like it was ending, even when it seemed <laughs> back during the COVID crash and BitMEX had 20 million between like 4,000 and zero. And, you know, we have that Arthur pulled the plug meme. Even in events like that, that occurred and we still went to almost $70,000 per coin. You had an instance like 2008 where people thought capitalism was over with. And, you know, now we are coming off the backs or maybe still in the greatest bull market in the last 50 years. You have so many people that are sort of manipulating this idea of recency bias and, and projecting this idea that they hate the way the world is going or you know, they don't like the president or, uh, you know, everything is rigged against them. And you have so many of these pessimists that for the last year have been, you know, 
getting stepped on, coming out of hiding, coming out of hibernation, and basically telling you, I fucking told you this was all a sham. Uh, You know, when they've been saying this for the past 15 years, or, you know, you've had people saying that Bitcoin was a Ponzi since like $10. Um, And so you have to remember, I think there's no point in you trying to find the bottom of the market if you don't recognize that there is no, there's basically no money to be made unless you write it back up. Now, again, like I said, this is very different. There are a lot of people that are perpetual traders that can make a lot of money on the way down. If you're somebody that um, buys put options, yeah, fuck, good luck with that. But the point is that most people lose the foresight to recognize that this isn't the end of the world. I really don't think we're about to enter a nuclear holocaust. I really don't think half this country is about to starve uh, like Soviet Russia in the mid-1900s, okay? I really think that people do not give credit to the resiliency of markets and of people. And I don't think that being that pessimistic over a long period of time is going to do anybody any good. Now, this isn't a recommendation to say, the world's going to be okay, it's okay to go out and buy AVAX before it goes to zero. Uh, you know, I don't know if AVAX is going to zero or not, but it doesn't mean in the same way that the rationale um, for being a huge doomer uh, shouldn't mean that you should sell everything. Uh, being optimistic about the future doesn't mean that things have to bottom now. It doesn't mean that the U.S. won't go into a recession or even a deep recession. But it does mean that if you're someone like me that operates on a longer time frame, focusing on economics isn't going to do you any good. Um, Peter Lynch, who is a famous hedge fund, or excuse me, mutual fund manager, he ran the Fidelity Magellan Fund for about 13 years, and he beat the market with a 27% annualized return when the S&P was returning about 12, uh, which is a huge amount of alpha. Basically said, if you spend 15 minutes on economics a year, you're wasting 12 minutes. And he's absolutely right. If we knew what the Fed was going to be doing tomorrow, uh, markets would be infinitely easier. And what you have to keep in mind is that markets are just using the information that's available today. But they're also forward-looking. It's a, it's a very hard dynamic to actually observe economics and be right about things, which is why you never see very many rich economists. Um, typically, the people that have done very well for themselves are people like Warren Buffett, who have focused on the microeconomics of cash-producing businesses, or people like Jim Simons that have built an unbeatable quantitative model. They're not people that have focused on the Fed and trying to predict their movements and what that's going to mean for your crypto or for your stocks or whatnot. What you do have to focus on is do you think that, you know, the company like Apple that you're thinking of buying stock in, do you think Apple's going to earn more money in five years? If you do, then you should buy the stock. If you think that it's not, maybe it's time to consider selling. Maybe it's time to uh, reduce your holdings, whatever you think is best for you. In the same way that you can't think that crypto is uh, entirely correlated to the Fed or the equity markets, you have to recognize that the Fed of crypto is, is a Bitcoin halving. And maybe a Bitcoin halving is the green light for you to go long in the same way that people say the Fed printing money is the green light to go long in equities. Um, so, but I think most people are going to get very, very hurt with the idea that they can find the absolute bottom. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people give me credit for being able to recognize, like, when I think something might be the top. I'm not very good at bottom picking. I did it once uh, with, with Bitcoin in the equity markets, but I'm, I'm a lot better at recognizing when I feel that things are taking a different turn. And, you know, people, I get DMs sometimes from people and they're like, well, what do you look at? How do you fucking know that's based on nothing? And I'm like, yeah, it, it really is, isn't based on anything. The thing that I look for is how people behave, right? Now, I think crypto is a very, very human natural market. Yes, there's more algorithmic trading. Yes, you have uh, software that allows you to TWAP and things like that now, or spread trading and whatnot, but typically crypto is the most human market of them all. Um, But that doesn't, you know, I I think if you, Twitter is a great tool to understanding uh, how people are behaving. And if you are level-headed enough to recognize when people are panicking about things they shouldn't be panicking about or um, have become so pessimistic that they don't even recognize that there's a lot of opportunity on the side of being long and optimistic on America or Bitcoin or whatever, there's a lot of money to be made. Uh, People forget that um, markets are zero-sum. For every winner, somebody's losing. And so if you want to be somebody that is on the side of making money, 
I think you have to be in a position to where you can either build the mental fortitude to stomach volatility long enough to uh, not have to pay attention to economics or the Fed or interest rates or anything like that and just try to focus on when you think something is valuable. Uh, that's more pertaining to equity markets. Um, and when it comes to crypto markets, I think you have to be someone that can stomach an unbelievable amount of volatility, um, can recognize that, you know, your best time to accumulate is when things are going down, but you need to ensure that you're accumulating things that aren't going to go to zero, which is a very hard thing to do, by the way. Um, and I think the easiest thing to accumulate would be Bitcoin. You know, a lot of people don't like Bitcoin because it doesn't produce those astronomical returns that all coins can if they get in on one early. Um, that's not the game that I play, but um, and if you're someone that doesn't like to play by that way, then you need to find a way to build out an edge, um, you know, trading, whether it be short term or with leverage or not. I don't think that's a good idea. I think that's uh, for most people, that's a great way to lose all your money uh, and eventually end in ruin. Um, but, you know, that's not my decision to make. So I basically just want to recap this episode with with the idea that um Bitcoin and stocks function on two different time frames. Don't fucking listen. Yes, they are correlated in the short term when it comes to algorithmic trading, but please do not believe for a second that they both run on the same fundamentals. Uh, second, people are operating on different time frames. You have to be able to carve out um, what is your time frame? What is something that gives you the best uh, chance of uh, good mental health, but also you know generating the best returns? Are you someone that will create better returns by making more decisions, or do you think it's better worth your time to ensure that you're going to make fewer decisions like I do? That was a very tough decision for me to make. I was making a lot of money trading options and swing trading tech stocks and uh, you know crypto, and I was killing Ethereum trading because it was basically trading like the Nasdaq. Um, you know, into the late, uh, into the later part of 2021. Um, but you just have to be able to recognize, you have to be uh, smart enough to know that you're a fucking idiot sometimes, um, you know, as funny as that sounds. Um, so it's very, very important that you're about, you're able to evaluate that everybody's has a different strategy. And just because someone disagrees with you doesn't mean that you're wrong. Um, it doesn't mean that you should focus on price if you're in crypto or the Fed and whether you're in stocks. What does matter is the sort of like head frame that you're working from. Are you someone that is going to try to build an edge trading? If you are, fantastic. But make sure you're aware of what volatility means for you. And if you're someone that doesn't want to like worry too much about volatility, then you need to build a, a strategy and put yourself in a position to where you can be the beneficiary of long-term market returns. That's as simple as it gets. So I hope this episode was insightful. If it was, make sure you share it with somebody who you feel needs to hear it. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you guys in the next episode.